the Seventh Circuit, Judge Salvador Mendoza to the Ninth Circuit, Judge Stephen Loker to the Southern District of Iowa, Nancy Maldonado, Northern District of Illinois, and Greg Williams to the District of Delaware. I want to welcome all of you and your families. This is an outstanding slate of nominees. I'm particularly pleased that two Illinois nominees are before us today. Both Senator Duckworth and I will introduce these two nominees. I uh, ask you to have uh, some patience and understanding that many of the senators who would like to be here at this moment have conflicts. They're trying to serve two or three uh, responsibilities at the same time. So we're going to be uh, flexible in the way we recognize people. Before I move to introductions, I'd like to make a note on today's second panel is Judge Stephen Loker, nominated to the Southern District of Iowa. The first nominee of this Congress who's received blue slips from both Republican senators. So I'd like to thank Ranking Member Grassley and Senator Ernst for working in good faith with the White, White House on this vacancy. They've charted a path I hope others will follow. I have the honor this morning of introducing Judge John Lee, nominated to the Seventh Circuit. Since 2012, he's been a U.S. District Court Judge on the Northern District. Born in Germany to Korean parents, his parents were a coal miner and a nurse. Judge Lee came to this country as an immigrant at the age of four, settling into a one-bedroom apartment with his family, family in the Albany Park neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, I still just remember uh, his speech to us when he was sworn in as district court judge and his struggles with the American language as a child. And it, he tells a fascinating story on that. Judge Lee excelled in school, though. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard and cum laude from Harvard Law School. He then began his career in public service, joined the Environmental and Natural Resources Division at the Justice Department, Afterwards, worked in private practice at several law firms in Chicago, including Mayor Brown and Freeburg Peters. His practice focused on complex litigation, including antitrust and intellectual property. 2012, President Obama nominated Judge Lee to the Northern District of Illinois. When he was confirmed by a voice vote, I underline, Judge Lee became the first Korean American to serve as an Article III judge in Illinois. Since joining the bench, he's written hundreds of opinions, presided over 35 trials that went to verdict or judgment. He sat by designation in the Seventh Circuit a number of times, writing several opinions for the majority. His nomination to the district court 10 years ago has, was historic, and he is poised again to make history as nominee to the Seventh Circuit. If confirmed, he'll be the first Asian American judge to serve on that court. Judge Lee, I welcome you and your family. It is also my great pleasure to introduce Nancy Maldonado, nominated to the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. She was born in Skokie, earned her A.B. cum laude from uh, Harvard College and her J.D. from Columbia Law School before returning to Illinois to clerk for my friend, Judge Ruben Castillo, on the Northern District. After check clerking on the court for two years, she spent the last 19 in private practice, specializing in plaintiff's side employment, civil rights, and fraud litigation. In addition to her work in private legal practice, she served the people of Cook County and the state of Illinois in a variety of capacities. In the early 2010s, she served as Special Assistant State's Attorney to Cook County to investigate fraud alleged by a whistleblower. In 2018, the Illinois Attorney General appointed her to serve as a consent decree monitor in two employment discrimination cases. And last year, Illinois Attorney General also appointed Ms. Maldonado to serve as Special Assistant Attorney General to investigate consumer fraud. She's worked outside the courtroom to keep Illinois safe. In 2019, appointed by Governor <clears throat> Pritzker, confirmed by the Senate, to serve as a member of the Illinois State Police Merit Board, which runs an equitable merit process for the selection and promotion of officers in the state police. I appreciate the important work she and the rest of the board have done in carrying out this critical responsibility. I look forward to this hearing. It goes without saying that Senator Duckworth joins me uh, and may physically join us soon. Uh, in applauding their experience and qualifications. I welcome uh, Judge Maldonado and her family today. Now I'm going to turn to Ranking Member Grassley for opening remarks he might have and the introduction of Judge Loker. Then we'll turn to our colleagues as they arrive to formally introduce a number of today's nominees. Senator Grassley. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I welcome the nominees and their families. I'm sure everybody that's related or friends of them are very happy for each of you. One of the district court nominees has been nominated to fill Judge Jarvie's seat in the Southern District of Iowa. So I want to thank Chairman Durbin for scheduling Judge Loker's hearing. I'm happy to introduce 
uh, Judge Stephen Loker to the committee today. I had the chance to visit with him and his family earlier today in my office. After Judge Jarvey said that he was uh, retiring, that was March of this year, Senator Ernst and I set up our Judicial Selection Commission. The commission was comprised of well-respected members of the Iowa legal community. They spent hundreds of hours reviewing and interviewing all the applicants. The commission unanimously supported Judge Loker. I'm pleased that the White House accepted Senator Ernst and my recommendation of uh, Judge Loker. Uh, you can see why Judge Loker received our support. He was born, raised in Iowa. Judge Loker has diverse legal experience and exceptional credentials. After graduating from the University of Notre Dame and Harvard Law School, he clerked for Judge John Gibson on the Eighth Circuit. Now, he started out his career at a firm in Chicago, uh, but we decided not to hold that against him uh, he, because he did come back to Iowa. He served as an assistant U.S. attorney for several years, and he focused on prosecuting white collar crime. After five years as a prosecutor, he moved to the law firm of Balin McCormick. He worked on both criminal and civil cases. His practice included everything from working on class actions involving data security to litigation over the Clean Water Act involving drainage districts. He also served as the firm's ethics counsel. On, uh, in 2021, he was chosen to serve uh, as a magistrate judge for the Southern District of Iowa. He served Iowa in that role for nearly a year with his impeccable credentials, experience in both civil and criminal law, and his trial experience. Judge Loker is well qualified to serve as federal district court judge, and it's my pleasure to support his nomination. Judge Loker, we welcome you. I wanted to explain just a little bit, uh, uh, thanking both uh, President Obama, President Trump, and President Biden now for accepting the recommendations of our Judicial Commission because for the 30 years that Senator Harkin and I represented Iowa, when we had Democrat presidents, I followed Senator Harkin's recommendations, however he selected them. I did it similar to what we did when we had Republican presidents. So Senator Ernst and I set up this commission process and without question, they, uh, both all these presidents, Obama and since have accepted our recommendations and I wanna thank them for not having any political squabble about how we do it. Thank you, Senator Grassley. We're gonna be at ease for a moment or two. We're waiting for the arrival of one or two senators to introduce uh, our nominees. Ah, just in time. Senator Murray, you couldn't have timed it any better. I'll let you get settled there for a minute and prepare to introduce Judge Mendoza. I walked in at the right moment. Yes. You ready for me? Yes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grassley, and all the members of the committee. Today, it is my honor to introduce President Biden's nominee to the U.S. Court of Appeals to the Ninth Circuit, Washington State's own Judge Salvador Mendoza, Jr., who I was very proud to recommend. Judge Mendoza is a tremendously qualified, having served as a district court judge for the Eastern District of Washington since 2014, when he was confirmed by the Senate by an overwhelming bipartisan majority of 92 to 4. In his time on the bench in the Eastern District, he has seen nearly 1,500 cases and presided over a number of complex civil and criminal trials. He's also heard appellate cases on the Ninth Circuit while sitting by designation. Before that, he served Washington State as a Superior Court judge. He has experience as a prosecutor 
in the State Attorney General's office and as a solo practitioner where he was often hired by Benton and Franklin counties to represent criminal defendants who could not afford their own attorneys. He also worked to establish the first drug court in Benton and Franklin counties along with prosecutors, defense attorneys, mental health professionals, and the judges in those counties. Judge Mendoza served with distinction in all of those prior roles and has been a trailblazer in building a more fair and just legal system for everyone, not just the wealthy and powerful. Beyond his professional qualifications, Judge Mendoza will bring an important perspective to one of the most consequential appellate courts in the, this country. Judge Mendoza's parents immigrated to the United States from Mexico, working as farm laborers, maids, and factory workers to build a better life for their family. And as a child, Judge Mendoza worked as a migrant farm worker alongside them. To me, having that experience on our courts is really meaningful. Judge Mendoza has rightfully earned the respect of both Democrats and Republicans for his judgment and even-handed application of the law after many years of public service. I know the people of Washington State can count on him to carefully review each case as an appellate judge and to respect every party that appears before him. So I urge every member of this committee to support Judge Mendoza's nomination. I'm honored to be here today to introduce him. Thanks, thank you, Senator Murray. I know you have a busy schedule, too, so we thank you for making it in the nick of time uh, to introduce uh, Judge Mendoza. I think I'm going to go ahead and ask the two circuit nominees to come forward uh, and to the table. There may come a point where my colleagues come visit us and we'll change, we'll try to be flexible as we, as we go here. Uh, but Judge Lee and Judge Mendoza will be next on the program. Please remain standing for a moment if you Please uh, repeat after me. Do you affirm that the testimony? Don't repeat after me, but respond to me. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you very much. Now you have an opportunity for opening remarks, and Judge Lee, I'll recognize you first. Thank you very much, Chairman Durbin. I feel so honored and privileged to be here with you today. I would like to thank you and Ranking Member Grassley for scheduling this hearing. And I would like to thank you, Senator Durbin in particular, as well as Senator Duckworth, my home state senators, for recommending me to President Biden. And I would like to thank President Biden for the honor of this nomination. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank my family for their enduring and unending support my wife, who herself is an accomplished physician, has joined me today, along with our daughter, who is talented in her own right and will be starting a PhD program in the fall. Our son could not be here today because he's taking final exams in college, and I wish him the best of luck. And I'm so proud of him and his accomplishments as well. I would also like to thank my parents, who unfortunately could not join us today but who I know are watching these proceedings in Chicago. It was their courageous decision nearly 50 years ago to leave everything and everyone that they knew behind to come to this great country to make a better life for themselves and their family. It is they who made my presence here today possible. Finally, I would like to express my deep gratitude to my friends, some of whom are present with me today and many more I know who are watching these proceedings online, as well as my court family at the Northern District of Illinois, and particularly my staff and my law clerks for their continuing dedication, hard work, and support. Thank you again, Chairman Durbin, and I look forward to addressing your questions as well as those of the committee. Thank you, Judge Lee. Judge Mendoza, I'm rec recognizing you next, and then we're gonna pause before questions. We have uh, Senator Carper here to introduce a district court nominee, but uh, we'll be right, you stay right where you are during that entire thing, and now please make your opening remarks. Uh, thank you so much. 
Uh, I want to begin by thanking you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley, for scheduling this hearing. I also want to thank uh, President Biden for this incredible honor of this nomination. My thanks as well to both Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell for their tremendous support. I want to especially thank Senator Murray for those kind words earlier today and for being an important force throughout my life. Thank you so very much. I would like to thank my court family and my in federal court and in state court, including not only the judges, but also the incredible staff and current and former law clerks and the lawyers who appear before me, along with my assistant Monica for over 20 years, who has really been a part of my family. Thank you for your help and your advice throughout the years. <clears throat> I would like to thank Judge McEwen, who by the way, it's the position that I would be filling in. It's her birthday today. So happy birthday, Judge McEwen. Uh, uh, she has uh, provided invaluable service, uh, not only to her cases, but to the circuit as a whole. Also to my friends and family in Washington and throughout the country, your advice and support has guided me throughout my life and I'd like to say thank you. I wanna thank my brother, Hector, uh, and my sister, Ilda, who had uh, to sacrifice the most as we were growing up, both of whom have raised beautiful families. My younger brother, Dr. Robert Mendoza, who's a brilliant engineer, and my youngest brother, Raul Mendoza, who's a physician assistant, I want to thank you both for your encouragement and support. To my father and my sister who are no longer with us, I miss your jokes, your sarcasm, and advice, but most of all, I miss you both. To my mother, who sacrificed so much for our family, who along with my father taught me the difference between right and wrong, the meaning of hard work, and who has supported me in everything I've done and made me the person I am. Gracias, mom. To my kids, Anthony, Danny, and Carmen Anthony, who wanted to make sure that this hearing was not gonna conflict with his junior prom. Uh, it's happy it didn't. Uh, Danny, who gets his uh, driver's permit on Saturday, so watch out, everybody. And then Carmen, who is the most responsible person, the responsible 12-year-old I know, uh, brought her computer to make sure she had her homework done. Uh, I am so proud of each of you and the people that you are becoming, and I'm excited to see the next steps in your journey. And of course, none of this could be possible without the love and support of my wife, Mia, who is a brilliant lawyer in her own right and whom I love very much. With that, Senators, I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Judge Mendoza. I'm going to uh, call on my friend and colleague, uh, Senator Carper, to say a few words of introduction, as well as Senator Coons. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, our ranking member, uh, Chuck Grassley, and all of our colleagues on this uh, committee. And uh, thanks for giving me a chance to introduce Greg Williams for his confirmation hearing to serve as a judge on the U.S. District Court for the District of Delaware. I always want, also, also want to acknowledge my Delaware wingman and friend and our colleague, uh, Senator Chris Coons, a member of this committee who shares my belief and the belief of the American Bar Association that Greg Williams is well qualified and well suited to serve in this important role for Delaware and for our nation. A few years ago, Senator Coons and I had the opportunity to make recommendations to the White House for two vacancies on this very same court. Uh, there was a president then of a different political party, and there was a different political party uh, in the majority in the United States Senate at the time. Our process then and now was simple and straightforward and borrowed heavily from a process that uh, we used while I was serving as governor of the state of Delaware. We relied then and relied now on uh, a judicial nominating commission of sorts and charged them with a simple task. Here was the task. Find the most qualified individual, regardless of political party, and help us make recommendations to the president. We use that same process this time around. It serves Delaware well, it serves our nation well, and has yielded yet another extraordinary nominee. Mr. Chairman and colleagues, uh, Greg Williams is a partner the firm of Vox Rothschild. He's a former president of the Delaware State Bar Association and President Biden's nominee to serve as the next judge on the U.S. District Court uh, for Delaware. But Greg is more than a lawyer. He's much more than that. He's a husband, he's a father, he's a son, and he's a brother. In fact, he's the youngest brother in his family of five with, get this, four older sisters. Uh, and even though those four sisters couldn't be here with us today, 
uh, I want them to know that they did a good job of helping to raise him and make sure he got on the right path, even leading him here today. Greg is uh, joined here today by his high school sweetheart and wife of 27 years, Tarina. Tarina, welcome. Big uh, by his uh, niece, uh, uh, I hope I didn't screw, screw this up too, Bally Jamaka, and, uh, and by his godmother, Joan Reed, and her two children, George Reed and Scott uh, Reed, who are really more like uh, Greg's second mom and, and brothers. There are also several of Greg and Harina's friends uh, present with us uh, today. I want to thank you all for, uh, for being an important part of Greg's support network. And uh, Tarina, a special thanks to you for your willingness to share your husband with our country so that if confirmed, he might have an opportunity to serve in this important role. A Villanova law grad, uh, Greg has worked at one of the top law firms in the country, Fox Rothschild, for the past 28 years. And through hard work and commitment to excellence in 2003, Greg became the first African-American attorney to have been hired as an associate and then be later named as a partner at Fox Rothschild. Greg learned those values, hard work and commitment to excellence in part as a member of the U.S. Army Reserve where he served from 1986 to 1994. After law school, Greg embarked on a successful legal career that has earned him the respect and admiration of Delaware's highly regarded legal community. Greg has a particular expertise in intellectual property and other business uh, litigation, which makes him particularly well suited for the Delaware District Court. More than his professional qualifications, though, is his personification of the golden rule, which calls on us to treat one another the way we want to be treated. He is the personification of judicial temperament. And like Senator Coons and me and many of our colleagues, Greg is a person of deep faith who understands what the word golden rule actually mean. And if confirmed, I believe that he will use it to guide him on the bench. Let me close by uh, saying this to our colleagues. We've all uh, heard... Uh, uh, saying that it's oftentimes uh, used in relations to bi boxing. The boxing, and you know, talking about an undersized boxer who punches above his or her weight. The Delaware District Court is one of the busiest courts in our country. It handles an array of cases related to intellectual property law, patent law, bankruptcy law, and other specialized business cases that are critical to the functioning of our national economy. Like our state, this court punches above its weight. And our nominee, Greg Williams, is not just the credentials and the temperament, but the strong work ethic that is necessary for this court to continue to function as one of the most important district courts in our country. I consider it a privilege to give him my strongest possible endorsement, and I just want to thank again our chair, our ranking member, and our colleagues for the opportunity to introduce Greg Williams to the member of this committee today. And to Greg, I say I leave you in good hands. And all the other nominees and their families and friends that are here, uh, congratulations and good luck to all of you. God bless. Thanks so much. Thanks, Senator Carper. With four older sisters and a wife, he's used to being overruled. So prepared for the bench. And thank you for that nice introduction. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley. Um, and thank you to my colleague and friend, Senator Carper. I um, want to welcome and congratulate all of the nominees appearing before us today. And I'm pleased uh, to join Senator Carper in introducing our uh, District Court of Delaware nominee, Greg Williams, uh, someone as a member of the bar I've known uh, for decades. Uh, he um, brings a special um, suite of skills and background to this particularly important court. Uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned, the District of Delaware is a particularly busy and important court. It handles a massive volume of often complex and commercially significant litigation. It is one of the busiest patent courts in America. Um, it is also a court that at times has struggled to reflect uh, the broad diversity of our state. Uh, I've known Greg uh, first as a rising star and then as a well-established leader uh, in Delaware's legal community. Uh, he began um, his practice in 1995 with Fox Rothschild, one of the most significant uh, of our firms in our region, um, and he has taken a whole series of leadership roles in our state bar. Uh, he's someone who served as past president of the Delaware State Bar, past chair of the Delaware State Judicial Nominating Committee. Uh, he helped create the Barristers Association in Delaware, serves on the board of the Legal Services Corporation, um, and he took the initiative to create an annual Martin Luther King Day of service uh, and to recruit hundreds of lawyers and community members from across our state uh, to spend that day engaged in service uh, to those in need in our community. Um, he's active at Seeds of Greatness Bible Church, a church well known to me, um, and is also someone who, given his litigating experience across a broad range of complex commercial issues and intellectual property issues, 
I think is particularly well suited for this court at this time. Um, since 2020, he's been serving as a special master um, for the District of Delaware in ongoing complex cases, uh, putting his considerable experience to work helping manage uh, discovery, um, including by conducting hearings and rulings on discovery disputes. Uh, as uh, my colleague mentioned in all of this, he is strongly supported by his wife, Tarina, their children, and extended family. We welcome them today as well. Um, I know Greg to be um, a skilled advocate, a brilliant lawyer, uh, a dedicated leader uh, in our community, uh, and I think his exceptional qualifications and lived experience uh, make him a strong asset to the court. Uh, I support him without reservation and urge my colleagues to move him swiftly to confirmation. Thanks, Senator Coons and Senator Carper for uh, kind introductions. We're going to come back to this panel of uh, circuit court nominees, uh, and I'll start with Judge Lee. Well, it's been over 10 years since you told the story. It was that you're swearing in at the district court level. It stuck with me all these years. I'm sure I couldn't recount it as well as you could in a few minutes. Tell us about the can of beans. Thank you, Senator. Um, the can of beans story starts when I was in kindergarten, and I didn't know any English at the time. I went to uh, kindergarten, and one day in art class, the teacher told all of us to bring from home a can of beans. I rushed home and told my mother, Mom, I need a can of beans to take to school for art class. And my mother, who is much wiser than me, looked at me and said, really, a can of beans? And I said, yes. And she said, are you sure? And I said, absolutely. And so she gave me a can of beans to take to school. The next day, uh, when art class came around, I took out my backpack and proudly took out the can of beans and put it on the desk. And I looked around, and everyone else had brought cereal boxes. Um, and so I was mortified because I thought to myself, my gosh, you know, how could I have gotten it so wrong? Um, the teacher really wanted us to bring cereal boxes for the art project. But I think that that's one of the instances early in my life that is a testament to the generosity of the people that I've met throughout my life and my career. Because my teacher had some extra cereal boxes. And so she gave that to me. And I don't remember what I made, but um, I really enjoyed the project. And I felt so much more comfortable. I remember that immigrant story because you've done so many wonderful things with your life ever since. Judge Mendoza, I'm sure you have a similar story to tell. Thank you, uh, Senator Durbin. You know, uh, growing up uh, as a, a, a farm worker, uh, we were often going from place to place. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in high school, I remember that uh, we needed to hurry up and, and uh, finish up uh, the work uh, that day so that we could make it by about 11.30 it was. That was the cutoff. And we wouldn't get uh, um, credit for the day unless we finished the work. So I was fin we were finishing the asparagus, uh, which we were doing that day. And we'd run uh, home, which was on the farm, uh, quickly change, put on our, our, our school clothes, and, and get to school by that 11.30 uh, cutoff. Well, sometimes we didn't make it. Um, and sometimes we got there about five minutes late. And I remember, though, the counselors and the teachers and the uh, admissions folks, and uh, uh, they would let us in and give us credit for the day. And that was so important because we wouldn't have otherwise been able to graduate. Uh, and I remember those individuals. Connie Flores is her name. Uh, that I remember uh, making sure that I got to my class. Uh, so it's, um, it's the people like that that I've seen throughout my life who have been incredibly supportive. I could go through for each of you and recount what you've achieved as judges and the fact that you've sat on the circuit courts, which you aspire to now, uh, already uh, having opportunities to consider and rule on important cases. But the record speaks for itself. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, other senators, Senator Grassley in particular, have a chance to ask questions. Thank you for being here today, and thank you, families, for joining you. Senator Grassley. My first two questions are the same to each of you, so I'll start out with Judge Mendoza. Uh, you've been a federal district court judge since 2014. If you're confirmed to the circuit court, which justice do you think has the judicial philosophy 
most closely resembling your own? And the same question to Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Grassley. <clears throat> I haven't studied all of the judicial philosophies of all of the justices. Um, I can tell you, um, uh, Senator, that what I try to do in my um, uh, everyday uh, case is I look at the cases that are before me, I evaluate the facts, I look at the statutes, and it, uh, hopefully the statutes are clear and I apply those to the case. If they're not, I bring the attorneys in uh, during oral argument to clarify any outstanding issues, and then I make a decision um, by make, uh, providing an opinion that is clear, that answers the question first, but more importantly goes through the individual analysis that I've made in that case so that they understand how I made the case and that a reviewing court can also make the case. I wouldn't expect you to understand the judicial philosophy, all 115 that have served, but is there one that you could say that you feel close to? Uh, 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 Senator, what I would say is that I admire uh, the wonderful uh, work that Justice Sonia Sotomayor has done um, because years ago when I was an attorney and I uh, bring together about 200 uh, students with a whole other uh, bunch of folks, we bring together 200 students um, and I contacted the Supreme Court which, where she was serving uh, as, a, as an attorney and this is some, some lawyer from Washington State calling the Supreme Court. Uh, and she gladly agreed to do a video for that group. And I will always remember that. I, I respect uh, the work that all of the just justices do, but I remember that particular instance. Same questions to Judge Lee. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Uh, like Judge Mendoza, I have not studied in depth all the judicial philosophies of the justices that have served our great country. Uh, there is one justice, though, that I do admire a great deal, and that has to be the first Chief Justice, Chief Justice John Marshall, just be, for being the trailblazer that he was and being prescient of the needs, not only of our country, but of the particular role that the ju judiciary has within our constitutional framework. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with Judge Lee. Uh, you have a case called Castle versus Snyder's. You upheld Governor Pritzker's stay-at-home executive order issued in the early stages of the pandemic. The order allowed essential businesses to operate 50% of cat capacity, but only allowed prayer and gatherings of fewer than 10 people. You held that this order would uh, withstand scrutiny even under the traditional First Amendment analysis because it was supposedly neutral and generally applicable. In light of the Supreme Court decision, Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, how would you evaluate the same claims in Castle today? Thank you, Senator Grassley, for that question. Um, as a preliminary matter, I believe that the right to religious liberty is one of the bedrock and most fundamental rights enshrined in our Constitution. When I ruled in the Castle case, which the Seventh Circuit later affirmed, um, I did not have, it was early on in the pandemic, and I did not have the benefit of the later Supreme Court cases, including Roman Catholic as well as Tandon, that has come down since that time. Uh, the, um, to the extent that uh, I would, if the case were to come to before me now, I would examine the facts very carefully in light of the standards that the Supreme Court has more recently announced. Okay, in Eldridge, uh, you declined to hold that a 20 month delay in prosecuting a concealed carry permit violated the plaintiff's second amendment rights. You granted the officials qualified immunity because you concluded that the right at issue wasn't clearly established. In your view, can a government delay the issuing a permit indefinitely as a means to effectively prevent law abiding citizens from owning guns? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, with regard to that case, Elridge, it dealt with the delay, as you say, in the issuance of a permit. Um, and the, I applied, when I ruled in Elridge, I applied the standards announced by the Seventh Circuit as well as the Supreme Court to the facts of that case. Uh, the, with regard to that case, uh, I did not think at the time, based upon the applicable precedent, 
that the right to have a permit issued uh, sooner than that was clearly established, uh, thereby providing the officials with um, qualified immunity. Thank you. Go ahead. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to uh, both of our nominees. Judge Lee, I enjoyed your story about bringing a can of beans. It reminded me very much uh, when, as you may know, I also am an immigrant and uh, I didn't speak any English either. And my story about uh, communicate, miscommunication involves bringing bread to school. I'll just leave it at that, but uh, I can definitely relate to your can of beans story. And I, I too was mortified when, um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> let me go on to the, the initial questions I ask of every nominee before any of the committees on which I sit. And those questions are, and this is all I'm asking both of you, since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? I have not, Senator. No, Senator. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? I have not, Senator. I have not, Senator. For uh, Judge Lee, a profile on you featured in the Illinois Bar Association's newsletter in 2002 noted that one of your greatest assets as a new judge is your experience as a young immigrant learning to adapt to a new culture. Like so many immigrant kids, including myself, adaptability is a skill we need to um, is a skill we need, and it certainly gives us a unique perspective. How uh, do you think that uh, judges with uh, diverse backgrounds is important in our judiciary, and why? Thank you, Senator Hirono, for that question. I do believe that diversity is very important for the judiciary, really for two basic reasons. First of all, it provides the courts with the benefit of different perspectives from all different types of perspectives from all walks of life to the issues that the courts deal with on a daily basis. And secondly, it provides the public with confidence and assurance that the views of everyone and everyone's interests in our country will be considered by the courts equally and openly. I uh, completely agree with your perspective. Judge Mendoza, uh, the, throughout your time practicing law, I understand that about half of your cases have involved representing indigent defendants in state or federal court. You have also been active with your Legal Aid Society. How has pro bono work and community service impacted your legal career and how will it uh, aid you as a circuit court judge? Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> uh, Working uh, with people who come to you uh, in their uh, most darkest hour and, and when they're facing the biggest challenge in their life um, and they don't have money to, to take care of that, that legal issue and making sure that they understood that uh, providing legal representation was so vital uh, to them and, and they appreciate that and you're honored to even serve in that capacity and it was uh, important for me as a as an attorney to provide that and and to provide pro bono legal services as well as a legal aid attorney. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judge Lee. Why did you want to become a lawyer? Thank you, Senator Hirono. Uh, growing up in an immigrant family in Chicago, uh, I remember helping my parents read and review and. Uh, look at various agreements that they had to sign. Employment agreements, I reviewed leases for apartments for them as a child. Uh, my father opened a um, family-owned business and I remember reviewing vendor contracts for him when I was, gosh, must have been sixth grade, seventh grade. And so I developed an appreciation of how important the law was to everyone's life. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to become a lawyer. Thank you. Um, I am happy to support both of you for uh, your appointments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Senator Kennedy. Judge, judge, congratulations. I'm not going to ask you your opinion on 
precedent, and I'm not going to really ask you about past cases. I just want to talk to you a little bit. Um, Judge Lee, t tell me what your understanding is uh, currently of the Chevron doctrine. Thank you, Senator Kennedy, for that question. My understanding currently of the Chevron doctrine is that um, the doctrine is a general matter that courts should give deference to agency factual determinations to the extent that the agency has been empowered by Congress to regulate certain areas. How much deference have, have the, have the uh, appellate court said you should give? Explain what you mean by giving them. I know what deference is, but do you give them a lot of deference? What if they come up with, a, with, with an interpretation that is patently absurd? Do you have to defer to that? Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Um, you know, Senator Kennedy, I know that the issue of um, the Chevron doctrine and the deference that courts should afford to agencies is an issue that is currently hotly uh, contested in various litigation. And as a sitting district judge and as a nominee for the Seventh Circuit, I feel that it would be imprudent to provide uh, my advisory views with regard I'm to not, that I'm issue. Not, look, I agree with you, Judge. I'm not asking your advisory view. I'm asking you to tell me what the law is. What's the current state of the law? I agree with you. Um, under Chevron, the courts have said um, Congress has delegated this, this expertise to the regular <laughs> agencies. You're supposed to t defer to them. What is the current state about how much deference and when, if ever, you don't defer to them? That's all I'm asking. Um, again, Senator Kennedy, uh, given how um, hotly contested that issue is, uh, I feel that at this point in time, um, as a sitting district judge and as a nominee to the Seventh Circuit, that... Uh, judge, let me interrupt you. You're yes. telling me you can't tell me what the state of... You won't tell me what the state of the law is on the Chevron doctor? I'm not asking your opinion on it. I'm just telling me what's the latest guy... Let me rephrase it. What is the latest guidance that the United States Supreme Court has given us on the Chevron Doctrine? I mean, it's pretty important stuff. Yes, Senator. The uh, Chevron Doctrine, as I stated, was that uh, the court should give deference to um, agency determinations in matters that specifically deal with their um, particular uh, realm that right. Congress has delegated. We went over that. How much deference? When, when do you not defer to the agencies? The, uh, as I recall, Senator, the, um, it, the degree of deference that a court should afford agencies really deals with the uh, process that the agency went through in making its determination, as well as to the exact and precise nature of that determination. Yeah, I don't agree with that, Judge, but that's okay. Um, I'm surprised you haven't seen the issue of Chevron before. You're going to see it on the Court of Appeals. It's pretty important stuff. Let me ask you, you Judge Mendoza, one question. I've only got a little bit of time left. Look, you wrote an a, 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 a law review article back in law school, and I don't hold that against you. You know, when I was in law school, uh, we all did things when we were young that, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, okay? But you, but you made, if I got this wrong, tell me. But you made one statement. I was looking at your, your, uh, your piece. I think this came from your article. Here's, I'm going to read you the quote. And I just didn't understand it. One, here's your quote. One must understand race as a socially constructed phenomenon that has, has historically served to subordinate racial minority groups while maintaining white supremacy. I've never thought of race as a socially constructed phenomenon. Tell me what you meant by that statement. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Senator, for that question. And I think you're referring to that article that I wrote 26 years ago yeah. when I was a, when I was a, a law student. 
And of course, since that time, uh, Senator, I've uh, became an attorney. Uh, I swore an oath. Uh, uh, at that point, I became a judge. In no, I'm not trying to trip you up. I'm just trying to understand what you meant by it. When I first read it, I said, well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting construct. I just don't understand it. And, and, and Senator, I, as I sit here now, I, I can't recall that specific quote. But what I can tell you is when I deal with the issue of race in my court, it's yeah. usually in a claim. And, and what I do in those claims is I apply the, uh, uh, the precedent on the matter. I look at the facts and I make those determinations and base my decision only on those issues and nothing else. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Congratulations. Thanks, Senator Kennedy. <clears throat> Senator Whitehouse. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to have you here. Congratulations on your nominations. I look forward to uh, supporting you. Uh, Judge Lee, particularly, thank you for your service to uh, ENR at the Department of Justice. When I was U.S. Attorney, we did some very good work with uh, ENR, and so I'm grateful to you for that particular uh, part of your service. Um, I would like to ask you uh, both about juries. Um, as judges, you handle juries right now. You see to their care and feeding figuratively and literally. And um, I think you also have a perspective on the importance of juries in our system of justice. Um, I have a belief, I guess, um, that the founders saw juries as more than just the fact-finding appendage of a judge, but actually saw them as a part of our American system of governance. It was part of the casus belli of the revolution when the uh, king went after American juries and when the Constitution at first did not include protection of civil juries, there was an explosion uh, well documented that resulted in the Seventh Amendment. And we have uh, Blackstone, who was a very potent authority to lawyers of that era, describing the importance of juries as the place where you can go to get a fair shake um, and where the power of the uh, powerful and more powerful and wealthy citizens could be reduced so that everybody could get a fair shake. And they do that through a lot of ways, like every jury is a new jury. You can't like go find out who the jurors are to put the fix in or let them know that you're their friend. Uh, and if you try to tamper with a jury, it's a crime. And so to me, the jury has a very important role in our system of government. And what I have seen is a Supreme Court on behalf of corporate special interests that is working very hard to take away Americans' access to juries, including preposterous mandatory arbitration contracts that they love to uphold and never talk about the Seventh Amendment when they do. So this is a frustration for me. I wanted to get your thoughts from your experience on how valuable juries have been in your courtroom and whether you see them also as an important part of our American constitutional system of governance and not just as fact finders in your courtroom. So Judge Lee first and then Judge Mendoza. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Um, I believe that juries are one of the bedrocks of, our, of the judiciary and our constitutional system. Um, when I impanel juries, I tell them that it's a unique opportunity for everyday citizens to be directly involved in the administration of justice in our society. That was Blackstone's other point. And uh, I believe that they all, in my experience, really take their service to heart. Judge Mendoza. Thank you, Senator. And I, I want to end, uh, begin on that uh, point, that <clears throat> when they, uh, when you talk to the jurors after their service, uh, they they beam uh, about the experience that they participate in this so important um, civic duty that they have, and they talk about that to their friends, and they talk about that to their families after they leave, uh, and it's such an important um, uh, process in our court. For what it's worth, I had the same experience talking with grand juries as U.S. attorney and attorney general. At the end of the day, they really felt that they had given important and valuable service. I would just ask you to remember that. 
as you go forward. Um, as you know, there are colleagues of yours right now who are writing articles about the destruction of the civil jury and how to revive it and what they're doing in their courtrooms to make sure that it remains a viable and vibrant institution. And um, jury trials have collapsed dramatically in the federal system. Um, and the Supreme Court, in addition to allowing companies ways to stay out of getting in front of juries, has also made it harder for cases uh, to get in front of juries. It seems like there's a very powerful focus on degrading the American right. institution of the jury by certain judges on this particular Supreme Court. Um, and to me, it's for the obvious reason that those wealthy and powerful citizens who have to be annoyingly equal before a jury when they're used to lording it over legislatures and uh, have special access to governors and executive branches um, don't like the jury very much. And they've got judges who are trying to degrade the jury so they don't have to face that uh, predicament of being treated equally. So please do whatever you can to make sure that your view of the importance of the jury in our American system of government is protected as you make decisions on the Circuit Courts of Appeal, and I wish you well. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations to both the nominees. Thank you for being here. Judge Lee, let me start with you. You are uh, committed to the Constitution, I assume. Is that fair to say? That is fair, Senator. And to the Bill of Rights. Yes. And do you think the Bill of Rights is deeply important to our foundation of government? Is that fair to say? I do. And the Equal Protection Clause as well. Is that fair to say? Yes, Senator. And the Constitution doesn't contain an emergency powers exception, does it? An emergency exception? Can it be suspended uh, in the case of an emergency? There is nothing explicitly in the Constitution that provides any sort of suspension during cases of emergency. Can the Bill of Rights be suspended during an emergency? Uh, there is nothing in the Constitution that provides for that. What about the Equal Protection Clause? Can it be suspended during an emergency? Government disfavor a certain group of people because it's convenient for the government? Again, um, Senator, there's nothing in the Constitution that provides for that. Okay, help me then understand your opinion in the Cassell case. This is about Governor Pritzker in your state, uh, his orders are in your, in, uh, within your jurisdiction, his stay-at-home order during the COVID-19 pandemic. He issued an order that allowed essential businesses and operations to operate at 50% capacity, but it applied only to secular institutions and services. He explicitly said religious activity was subject to a different rule. Religious activity, churches, synagogues, could only have 10 people in them. Everybody else, all other essential services, could have 50%, so hundreds of people go shopping, whatever. But religious activity, oh no, only, only 10 people or fewer for, for those folks. Different rule, explicitly different rule. You upheld that in the Cassell case this differing standard that singled out religious people for disfavor. And you said that the Supreme Court of the United States has said that different rules apply during pandemics. The strange thing is, is I'm reading the case on which you relied, and it says nothing of the sort. You cite Jacobson versus Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's a 1905 case. You say that the Jacobson court explained that the traditional tiers of constitutional scrutiny do not apply. That phrase doesn't appear anywhere in that opinion. Tiers of scrutiny weren't invented by the Supreme Court for another 40 years. So help me understand where you're coming from in this case. Why did you conclude that religious people could be singled out for disfavor? Thank you, Senator Hawley, for that question. Uh, as I stated previously, um, when I decided that the Cassell case, which was later affirmed by the Seventh Circuit, um, it was early on in the pandemic, and um, we did not have the benefit of the various other rulings by the Supreme Court that came down after my ruling on Cassell. That held just the opposite. Um, that uh, the, I, I guess I'm referring to uh, Roman Catholic as well as right. Andon. Right, and in which the Supreme Court held that you could not single out religious people for disfavor. State of New York tried to do precisely the same thing, and the Supreme Court said, Actually, plaintiffs have a strong likelihood of success on the merits. You said they have no likelihood of success on the merits. So just help me explain. The Supreme Court took a totally different view. Help, help me explain how you looked at the same Constitution and came to a, a totally different conclusion. Why, why is it okay to single out religious people for disfavor? I don't understand it. 
What I looked at was whether or not the uh, Governor Pritzker's order was neutral and generally applicable to decide whether, at that time, to decide whether acti secular activities were generally applicable. I looked at the type of activities uh, as well as kind of the sort of risk, uh, the varying degree of risks that were present in those instances. So, for example, well, can I just I, stop I, you right there? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I've only yes. got one minute left. I'm sorry, but it is, you, you've raised, I think, a really important point because the standard is when it comes to First Amendment violations, is the, is the law neutral and generally applicable? This regulation wasn't neutral and generally applicable. It, it had one set of rules for shops, businesses, and a completely different set of rules for churches, which, of course, with the U.S. Supreme Court ruled. I, I don't understand how you can look at that and say it's neutral and generally applicable. The uh, order, as I recall, also closed, for example, movie houses and auditoriums, as well as schools. And so when I considered the activities at movie houses and schools compared to activities carried on at churches, I found those to be, at the time, using the time pre tandem test, to be generally comparable or comparable. Uh, I agree, and I found that the... But the order said that re religious houses of worship were essential. So it said that essential businesses could be open, essential services, but at 50%. Initially, it didn't include any, any carve-out for religious, any acknowledgement that religious services might be essential. He amended that, said, no, they are essential, but I'm going to cap them. So two completely different rules. Let, let me just, my time's about expired, so let me just read to you something from the Jacobson case, which you cite, which... I'm surprised you didn't heed. Here's what the Jacob case says. No rule prescribed by a state, nor any regulation adopted by a local governmental agency shall contravene the Constitution of the United States or infringe any right granted or secured by that instrument. A local enactment or regulation, even if it's based on the police powers of a, of a state, must always yield in a case of conflict with the exercise by the government of any power it possesses under the Constitution or to any right which that instrument, meaning the Constitution, gives or secures. I, I'm baffled that you would cite this case in support of a decision that treated religious believers differently, indeed disfavored them, compared to other people. And I think the fact that the Supreme Court reversed on precisely this case later doesn't say much for the analysis that you employed, which frankly I find pretty alarming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome to you both, and thank you for your service on the district court. Uh, each of you is a trailblazer already in your judicial service. Uh, Judge Lee, when the Senate confirmed your nomination to the district court in Illinois in 2012, you became the first Korean American Article III judge in Illinois, and now, if confirmed, you'd be the first Asian American judge ever to sit on the Seventh Circuit. Judge Mendoza, if confirmed, you'd be the first Hispanic judge to serve on the Ninth Circuit from Washington State. Uh, I know that your judgments on the bench would not be influenced by any of your personal background because you'd look at the law and the facts of each case, but you would serve as role models and probably mentors for others in establishing the importance of diversity on the bench, but also in our profession, the legal profession generally. I wonder if you could uh, explain each of you uh, why you think it's important and what steps you've taken and would take to make the legal profession more inclusive and why that's important. Thank you, Senator. Um, diversity is incredibly important to the court system. One of the reasons is that it provides the public with confidence in the judiciary and assurance that the courts are open to everyone in our society. Uh, when I came to the United States as a four-year-old boy, I'm sure that my parents could not have dreamed that I would become a federal district judge 
and have the honor of being nominated to the appellate court. Um, I think it's a testament to America's greatness as well as the greatness and the generosity and openness of the people who live in this country. Um, throughout my career, I've had the great fortune of being mentored and drawing inspiration from many others, uh, Asian and non-Asians who've come before me. And if I'm so fortunate enough to be confirmed on the Seventh Circuit, I hope to inspire others to reach for their dreams as well. Uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> One of the great opportunities that we have as, as judges is to talk to different groups of students uh, and provide that inspiration that you speak of, Senator, and the um, impact that you have in their lives is, is, is quite enormous. We, one of the programs I, I work together um, uh, is, and I mentioned it earlier, where we bring together about 200 students from local schools and talking to them and exposing them to careers in the law, whether you want to be an FBI agent, a lawyer, a judge, uh, and the uh, appreciation that those students uh, uh, face is, is that, that we receive from that is, is quite incredible and inspiring uh, to me individually. Uh, so making sure that they understand that regardless of what obstacles they faced, whether they were on food stamps, as I was, whether they lived in public housing, as I did, whether they and it had to learn a, 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 a different language growing up, as I did, that those are not obstacles. There's part of who they are. And that's important as well. Thank you both. Uh, on the Judiciary Committee, we have a special interest in the fairness and the appearance of fairness in our judiciary. Making our bench look more like America is part of that responsibility. We had the great honor and exciting privilege of confirming the first black woman to the United States Supreme Court recently. And I think it is a tribute to this country, as you said so eloquently, Judge Lee, and as you affirmed, Judge Mendoza, that we are advancing the diversity and inclusiveness of our bench to match the diversity and inclusiveness of our society. So thank you very much for your service. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Judge Lee, um, your analysis of the beloved church's free exercise claim doesn't include, um, it, well, you, you, you reached the conclusion that this case was not similar to Lukumi, uh, uh, because, as you put it, quote, nothing in the record suggests that Governor Pritzker has a history of animus against religion or religious people. And the order treated churches similar to movie theaters and bowling alleys instead of essential businesses. But um, I'm not sure that completely resolves the question, does it? I mean, isn't, isn't it a little bit different uh, the, the right to bowl or the right to watch a movie, isn't that a, a little bit different than what's protected by the First Amendment? Thank you, Senator Lee. Uh, clearly, those activities are different. But when I was looking at, at applying the neutral and general applicability test um, to determine the uh, level of scrutiny to give to Governor Pritzker's order, um, I was looking at whether or not the order treated comparable secular activity better than comparable religious activity, or whether they treated comparable religious activity more negatively than secular, comparable secular activity. And so that's where the analysis came from. But why, why limit religious worship to 10 people? How, how could one justify limiting religious worship to 10 people in a facility that could accommodate a larger group while still preserving the, uh, the six feet of distance recommendations. So Senator, the, um, as I noted previously, since that decision was issued and since the Seventh Circuit affirmed my ruling, uh, the Supreme Court has provided further guidance 
on what factors should, a court should consider in doing that comparability analysis. And certainly uh, after, uh, for example, in Tandon v. Newsom, the court at, talked about comparability and how it should be uh, evaluated looking at the interests, the government interest that the restriction was to further. And certainly at this time, if a castle like Cap if a case like Castle were to come before me, that is the rule that I would apply. Sure. No, I, I understand that. I, I get that. That precedent has come out since you ruled in that case. I, 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 I'm just asking about, um, based on precedent that it was in place at the time, it seems to me fairly apparent that uh, it would matter if the church had uh, more accommodations. Uh, what if the, what, what about the church's parking lot? Um, being unable to accommodate drive-in services. Does that matter? Should that have mattered? Thank you, Senator Lee. I believe that um, Governor Pritzker's order did allow uh, what, what became popularly known as uh, parking lot services or, dri or driveway services. Uh, and so I believe the restriction was specifically looking at uh, gathering of church members inside the church. Okay, so what if the, the, the beloved church ran a soup kitchen where the capacity is unlimited so long as people are able to socially distance? Um, at what point would the soup kitchen turn into a religious activity subject to the 10-person limit? Senator, um, that is a really interesting question. It is a question that did not come before me in the Castle case. And given the uh, state of affairs now in this country uh, with regard to the pandemic, um, I'm afraid a question, might, a question like that uh, is, may come before me. And as a sitting federal judge and a nominee of Seventh Circuit, I believe it'd be imprudent to provide my advisory thoughts with regard to an issue like that. Okay, well, would it, would it matter, uh, uh, what, what if the pastor led attendees in a blessing uh, before meals were distributed? Would that make a difference? Um, again, Senator, with regard to particularly the issue of prayers and the context of prayers, I know that, that there's, an issue, there's a case before the Supreme Court and there are, um, those are issues that are hotly contested in litigation. And no, I, again, I, I'm afraid that that's something that I would not be able to opine on today. Yeah, uh, I, look, I, I see I'm out of time, but I'm, I'm troubled by this because the, the, the minute government gets into the business of saying, you're fine if you're operating at this moment as a soup kitchen, but don't you dare pray or you'll be put into a different classification. The minute you pray, or we deem you to be operating as a church and no longer as a soup kitchen, you're subject to a 10-person limit. I understand that there's ongoing litigation. I, I respectfully disagree with your suggestion that the outcome of such a case would be affirmatively in doubt based on that. I mean, I, I, I think in that circumstance, we're dealing with a, a very core, pretty clear and present uh, uh, equal uh, uh, free exercise clause violation. The minute the government gets involved in telling churches how to operate and treating them differently, subjecting them to more restrictive treatment simply because they are operating religious services, that's a huge problem for, not for me, for the free exercise clause. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Blackburn. I'm sorry, Senator Ossoff. I note your arrival. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Uh, congratulations, Judge Lee and Judge Mendoza on your nominations and thank you for your judicial service to date. I'd like to begin by asking you both this question. Will you pledge to faithfully apply the law without bias, without regard for your personal policy or political preferences? Absolutely, Senator. I do, Senator. Judge Mendoza, could you please characterize for the committee how you'll approach First Amendment cases? Uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> well, uh, as you always do, uh, uh, Senator, you begin by looking at what the First Amendment indicates. 
Uh, and you begin by looking, as I do with any legal issue, I begin by looking at what the Supreme Court has indicated on the matter. And I apply that, as I do in every single uh, case involving the First Amendment. And I apply that statute to, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Constitution to the uh, individual facts in the case. Judge Lee, why is, in your view, the First Amendment so important in our republic? Why are protections of freedom of speech and publication, petition, assembly, exercise of religion, why are these vital in our society? Thank you, Senator, for that question. The First Amendment I be has the core fundamental rights that are vital to our society, both in terms of our functioning as a democratic system, uh, a democracy, and also as functioning as a society that respects the rights and views of everyone within our society. Judge Mendoza, anything to add? Uh, I, I completely agree with, uh, with Judge Lee. Um, it is fundamental to who we are as Americans and, and um, uh, an important right. Judge Mendoza, in, in your experience, how important is it that uh, indigent defendants, defendants who lack the resources uh, to afford their own counsel have access to uh, a public defense and perhaps federal defenders uh, who have appeared before you in the courtroom. Why is the Sixth Amendment right to counsel and the precedent established by Gideon v. Wainwright so vital? Thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. And, and if you think about your question, it really, um, you have to put yourself in the, in the shoes of those individuals facing that um, uh, uh, charges, criminal charges. Imagine that. Imagine you're sitting in that uh, position and you are facing the weight of uh, criminal charges, either federal or state charges. You feel as an individual defenseless. Uh, you feel, uh, and that's what they have relayed to me uh, when I uh, represented uh, indigent defendants. And they didn't have the funds to represent themselves and making sure that they understood that I was gonna zealously represent them ag um, against those particular charges. And they felt a sense of Assurity and and then of course uh, the protections of the uh, Constitution affirm uh, that duty and that responsibility as as lawyers. Thank you, Judge Mendoza. Uh, my final question for each of you, beginning with you, please, Judge Lee, is um, why why do you seek this judicial office? Thank you, Senator. Uh, during the last ten years, as I've been sitting as a federal district judge in the Northern District of Illinois, uh, I've come to deeply appreciate and um, really love the rule of law and the impact that the court system can have on the lives of everyday people. Uh, I believe that um, serving on the appellate court will um, just further that goal and my personal goal of public service. Judge Mendoza. Thank you, Senator. Uh, over the course of the last uh, eight years, um, I've had the privilege of serving by designation on the Ninth Circuit. And in that process, process have gotten to know the wonderful judges uh, that, are, that are there. And that interaction, um, that interplay that happens, and the, abil the ability to share my experience as a district court judge with their experience, I think make for a better uh, order and something that hopefully um, the folks that are reading our opinions uh, clearly understand how we're, how we're thinking about it. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Ossoff. Senator Blackburn. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Lee, I want to come to you. Have you ever been to seminary? Do you have any theological degrees? Um, thank you, Senator Blackburn. I do not have any theological degrees. Okay. Um, I have... Take right. in, yes, I, I've done some reading on it. Thank you. Well, returning to the Cassell case and the way you treated essential entities separate and different from religious entities, as you can see, there are three of us that have asked you about this. And it is an issue of importance because of the inconsistency that you brought to bear in that decision. And... Um, it looks as if this order facially violated Smith's requirement of neutrality. And I, 
I'm concerned about that. I'm also concerned, and this line really concerns me in your, uh, in your opinion, and I'm quoting you, until testing data signals that it is safe to engage more fully in exercising your spiritual beliefs, whatever they may be, plaintiffs as Christians can take comfort in the promise of Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with you. Now you put that in there. So do you believe that government has the authority to tell religious observers what their faith requires of them? Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Um, I do not believe that the government is authorized to direct how groups of faith should define their particular Do you believe beliefs. that government could tell Christians, we've just come through Lent, do you think they could tell them 30 days is enough for Lent? Or tell those of the Muslim faith that four daily calls to prayer, that that is enough? That, there, that government has the ability to restrict that community of fellowship? I don't believe that the government has the authority to tell faith groups what to believe, Senator Blackburn. I do think that your decision shows a misunderstanding of the Supreme Court's clear precedent on the First Amendment free exercise clause. Um, and elsewhere in that same decision, you wrote that, and I'm quoting you again, the traditional tiers of constitutional constitutional scrutiny do not apply, end quote, during an epidemic. So whose job is it to decide when a pandemic or an epidemic begins and when it ends? Is it the court? Is it Congress? Is it unelected bureaucrats? Who is going to decide that? Because in your opinion, you appear that you had decided. Thank you, Senator Blackburn, for that question and allowing me to explain. Um, when I approached Castle and issued that decision, I was duty bound by oath to follow Supreme Court and Seventh Circuit precedent. Um, Jacobson was a Supreme Court case, um, and Jacobson was actually a, just prior to my ruling. I'm going to cut you off at that because it is clear. You looked at secular entities in one way and religious entities in another, and I have a problem with that. Judge Mendoza, I want to come uh, with you. 96, you were in law school, and you wrote a comment entitled, When Maria Speaks Spanish, Hernandez, the Ninth Circuit, and the Fallacy of Race Neutrality, which criticized the Supreme Court's decision in Hernandez versus New York, which was a... 1991 decision. In that comment, you wrote, attorneys and judges are not shielded from the prejudices that surround them. In fact, they are too affected by the social norms that often drive our conscience and unconscious decisions. So what kind of prejudices affect you and how do they drive your decisions as a federal judge? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. As you noted, uh, that uh, comment was 26 years ago yeah. uh, before I was a lawyer uh, and I had taken an oath and before I was a judge. Uh, and uh, I think that we all in general have preferences. Uh, and what I do as a judge is make sure that I make the decisions, not on any preference, but on the facts that, is be that are before me and on the law, including the precedent both by the Ninth Circuit and the Supreme Court. That's, and I issue an order, Senator, that makes clear what my ruling is, but what my thinking was, how exactly I reached that decision. And I try to do that in every uh, single case. Well, I'm, I'm out of time, but I will come to you for a written explanation because there was another co comment you had in there about you thought Hernandez was wrongly decided because it failed to take into account the effects of racism in our justice system, the anti-immigrant hysteria gripping the country and the practical effect on Latinos, and that the court created a legal fiction that severely restricts Latino participation in the jury 
selection process. So I will come to you for a written explanation there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Mendoza, Judge Lee, congratulations on your nomination and to your family, so I'm sure proud of you. Um, uh, Judge Lee, I'm not going to cover the ground that Senator Blackburn, I think Senator Lee and Senator Holly did on the, uh, the COVID case, but maybe to give uh, for the better, I'm not an attorney, I haven't been a Supreme Court clerk, so I'm going to approach this a little bit differently. I think that you have to understand at those times, we had a patchwork of closings across the country. We had some states that would allow bars to be open with you know, 40 or 50 people in a relatively small space subject to social distancing. And we had churches, my church probably can uh, seat almost 1,000 people, at least 800, uh, that could have far fewer than that. And so I think a lot of the concern that we have, aside from the, the fundamental concept of uh, practicing your faith, um, is what, <clears throat> excuse me, a lack of worship did to a number of people. I mean, there were a number of people, I mean, you know, suicide rates, a number of things were up. Domestic violence was up. Child abuse was up. So in our heads, we're trying to scratch our heads why we were picking and choosing what a safe environment was at the expense of the practice, that, you know, the, the practice of one's religious faith. That's what's motivating us. And I think empirically, it's very difficult to see how we could hold religious institutions to a different standard. And I think that's the, the purpose for our question. So we'd probably uh, have to uh, agree to disagree. And then there's the other piece, which is uh, I, for one, do not believe, I uh, hope and pray uh, that our next pandemic is 100 years from now, but I doubt seriously that it will be. I think we have muscle memory now so that we could have some pathogen move through society and have these snap back. And so we've got to do a better job because I think it was fundamentally on its face unfair. So that's, that's more of a statement uh, than a question. Um, uh, Judge Mendoza, I've, I've got two questions if time allows. One, uh, and I, I'm honestly looking for uh, more background, and the, uh, is it Cower versus Garland? Are you familiar with that case? Uh, I, I, I am, Senator. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the, the circumstances of that case that uh, led to your ruling? Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> if I recall, Cower was a case where I sat by designation yep. on the Ninth Circuit, and in Cower, uh, I think the um, uh, the panel was considering, among other things, whether or not the threats uh, of death to uh, that individual constituted um, uh, a basis for her protections under the CAT coverage, and and that was uh, that was the analysis uh, or the the one of the issues or the main issue in that case. Um, the other one that's been touched on by some of my other colleagues. Um, Talk to me a little bit about um, why you believe or you believed in the past that uh, we have a judicial system that's systemically racist. Tell me, tell me today in terms of, again, I'm not a judge, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna read through your ruling. I do read through your rulings, but I'm not gonna pretend to be a judge here. I'm just trying to understand, give me some fact patterns that would suggest that we have systemic race. I get the need to have a diverse bench. Uh, the fact that we don't doesn't necessarily build a case for, for the judiciary being systemically racist. So give me some layman's terms, examples of why you do think we have a problem with systemic racism in our judicial system. Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, and I, again, I think you're referring to comments that I made when- 26 years ago. 20, 26. Everybody made bonehead comments, or I think your sons are <laughs> probably a lot younger than 26, you will too. Um, but no, so I'm, I'm trying to ask a, a comment that was made 26 years ago, which I believe we should excuse. We set a different bar here at other uh, hearings where what you said in a high school year, yearbook can be used against you. I get that. But now I'm thinking about your contemporary thinking. Sure. Today, do you believe that there is evidence of systemic racism in our judicial system? Well, uh, Senator, uh, what I see every day is that uh, the lawyers uh, come into uh, my court 
arguing their cases um, and zealously representing their interests. And my job as a judge is to uh, go into that with an open mind, listening to those arguments and making sure that um, they're given a fair shot, that I, that I understand what their arguments are and that I look at the law that applies. Thankfully, um, the judges that I have served with, Senator, uh, are judges that hold true to their oath, which is to have that same open mind. And that has not been my experience with the, certainly not my bench in the Eastern District of Washington, all of whom I uh, respect tremendously. Yeah, well, the, uh, the reason I raise that is I hear people say it, and, you know, the, the zealots at either end of the spectrum are going to say what they're going to say. Uh, but when we have people that are making their way um, through, the, uh, through the courts, I think it's important for you all as stewards of the institution to be careful with the words you use and the perceptions you give the population. The Article Three branch is under assault right now. Uh, just evidence... Uh, Supreme Court justices who have uh, people parked outside on their lawns. I hope that never happens to you as you make your way through the courts. But we're finding ways to, I think, really discredit the Article Three branch. And for those who are stewards of that branch, and you all arguably are, um, then we need to make sure that those words from 26 years ago give meaning to the common day. I mean, do we really see it? What do we need to work on? We need to work on diversity in the course. There's no question. We need to work on increased diversity across this nation in all aspects of employment. But we also need to make sure that people that are not attorneys who just take the base, and, and that erodes the credibility of a very important branch of our government. So thank you all again for being here and uh, for your willingness to serve. And congratulations again to your families. And really think before you post on any social media. As a matter of fact, delete your accounts. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I would also note uh, uh, Senator Kennedy was going to vote. I know the vote was called, but he did say he was coming back. I don't know if he knew that he was next up in the order, but he did mention that he was coming back. Okay. Senator Kennedy was recognized with this panel earlier. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, let, let me just echo your comments in terms of court security and the safety of members of the uh, judicial branch. I could not agree with you more. I wanna make sure that that is well known to be a bipartisan position and that this committee and others are working, appropriations committee, to make sure that uh, the men and women who serve in the judiciary, their families, their homes, uh, are all safe from uh, any type of violent attack against them. I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Chair. And frankly, I think the American people need to recognize that if, if we don't recognize the inappropriate behavior that's occurring outside of the homes of Supreme Court justices now, circuit court justices are next. And it won't be one-sided. So we have to, as elected officials, as court officials, recognize that this behavior is despicable. And one of the greatest threats, <clears throat> excuse me, to the Article Three branch that I've observed in my lifetime. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and let me quickly add, thank goodness Congress has been exempt from this kind of treatment. Uh oh I forgot about the insurrectionist mob on January 6, 2021. Are the, are the six mobs, two it by sea and two it by land, who have trespassed on my property, protested me, and disrupted my neighborhood over the last five years? And I would add them to the same category of reprehensible conduct in the name of constitutional rights. And I agree. January 6 was reprehensible. Any assault on these democratic institutions, we need to jointly send the message to the American people that is the exact opposite of anything a democratic, the greatest nation on earth should be willing to accept. You can't accept a protest because it happens to be a message that you're sympathetic to. This sort of behavior is despicable and all of us need to not uh, discriminate between one that's a little bit more, one that's a little bit less, like Speaker Pelosi said with the righteous protest in relationship to some of the protests that are going on right now in the yards of Supreme Court justices. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think there's anything righteous about it, whether it was on Congress January 6th or on any member of the judiciary today, period. Uh, violence is never acceptable. Uh, I want to give uh, Judge Lee a moment to He's received repeated, repeated questions about your ruling in Cassell. And uh, I just wanted to note for the record that that case was brought before you 
in the spring of 2020. This was at an early stage in the pandemic. Uh, and frankly, we didn't know what we were facing. It was scary. Some said, forget it, it's going to disappear on its own. But I think we were beginning to feel that perhaps it was much more serious. And if I, if I understand this correctly, uh, you were asked to uh, make a ruling on the propriety, whether to enjoin the uh, enforcement of uh, Governor Pritzker's COVID-19 stay-at-home order. Uh, and at that point, you were following the law that had been established, in, to your knowledge, to the point where I understand when the Seventh Circuit reviewed your uh, opinion in the case that you've been questioned on, they called it, quote, swift and thorough and gave a unanimous support to your position in that case. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. Uh, and subsequently, the Supreme Court established different standards uh, based on cases coming out of New York and California, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Uh, subsequent to the uh, Seventh Circuit's affirmance of my decision, the Supreme Court issued rulings that further clarified this area. And could you distinguish why you coupled religious activity with movie theaters and uh, what was the other one? Looking here, bowling alleys. I bowling believe. alleys, but not in the uh, comparable to grocery stores, manufacturing plants. Thank you, Senator. The record that I was looking at before me uh, that governed my decision uh, was a record where people that did grocery shopping or visited places like that were just their intent was to get in, get out, get in buy the groceries and get out. Whereas places such as schools, bowling alleys, and movie theaters where, pe where people congregated together, they spoke to one another, they stayed in an enclosed area. Um, and so when I was engaging in the comparability analysis back at that time, um, I found based upon the record before me that the church that was at issue, the beloved church, uh, and the activities that people engaged in were more comparable to uh, secular social settings like bowling alleys, movie theaters, or even schools where people weren't intending to just go in and get out as quickly as possible. They were going in to fellowship and socialize and to engage in prolonged activity. Thank you. Now, uh, you've been told both that you may receive questions for the record. We hope that if you do, you'll respond to those in a timely fashion so that members can review your responses. We thank you both for being here today, and congratulations to you and your families. Uh, and now we're going to move to the second panel. Three nominees would remain standing while I administer the oath. If you would uh, please raise your right hand. The affirmed testimony you're about to give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that the three nominees have answered in the affirmative, and now I'll give each five minutes to uh, say a word. We'll go in alphabetical order. Ms. Judge Loker, you're first. Thank you, Chair Durbin, for presiding over this hearing and allowing the committee to consider my nomination. I want to thank President Biden for nominating me for this important position. Thank you, Ranking Member Grassley, for your kind introduction this morning. I also want to thank you and Senator Ernst for recommending my name to President Biden for this nomination. It's an honor. I have many family members with me today. My parents, Jim and Charlotte Loker, are two of the most supportive parents a person could hope to have. My dad has been practicing law in North Central Iowa for almost 50 years and personifies the best of an Iowa lawyer. He's someone who helps people solve their problems. My mother is a retired high school chemistry teacher 
as a scientist, she taught me that you shouldn't draw conclusions until you've carefully and objectively analyzed the evidence. I put this lesson to use every day in my work as a judge. My older sister, Emily, is here. She is a successful attorney and terrific person, not in that order. My younger sister, Elizabeth, couldn't be here today, but I would describe her in the same way. Uh, of course, I'm so happy to have my wife, Sarah, here with me today. Like many working couples, Sarah and I have to juggle the demands of being parents with the demands of our professional careers, but we support each other and we make it work. One of my favorite things about our relationship is that each of us is just as proud of the other person's accomplishments as we are of our own. With that in mind, I'm proud to point out that Sarah is a district judge in the Iowa State Court system and has an excellent reputation across the state of Iowa for the quality of her work. I think Sarah would agree, though, that our most important work happens at home, where we are parents to four boys, Henry, Alden, Miles, and Grant, all of whom are here today. They are talented, thoughtful, and creative kids, and Sarah and I are incredibly proud of them. Chair Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley, thank you again for inviting me to this hearing today. I look forward to the committee's questions. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Maldonado. Thank you, Chair Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for the opportunity to appear before this committee today. Additional thanks goes to Senator Durbin for his gracious introduction of me and to Senator Duckworth. Thank you both for sending my name along to President Biden and I thank President Biden for the honor of this nomination. I am grateful to my family, friends, teachers, and colleagues who have brought me to this moment here today. I have some of them here today. My son is here and my daughter is watching remotely. You are kind, mature, and resilient children. I love you very much. Thank you to my mother, Carmen Maldonado, who is here today, and my siblings, Sylvia and Albert Maldonado, for their love and support. My thanks goes to my partner, Emanuele, for supporting me in the big and small things. Thank you to my longtime friends who are here, Noemi Flores, Sol Flores, Jaya Shrathod, and Luis Avila. I also want to acknowledge my late father, Avelino Maldonado, and my late grandmother, Iluminada Gonzalez. Papa, as we called him, came to the mainland alone as a teen with a fourth grade education and worked in the copper mines of Utah before settling in Chicago and starting his own food business. Together with my mother, a registered nurse, my parents created a home filled with love, faith, high expectations, and respect, where my siblings and I were able to thrive. Our parents instilled in us the belief that we could do anything we set our mind to, an invaluable gift. Abuela, my grandmother, also gave me many gifts, the gift of faith foremost. I also want to thank my large extended family, especially many aunts and uncles, including my aunts Irma and Ada and uncles John and Alex, who were a large part of my development as a person. To my colleagues, past and present from Minor, Barnhill, and Galland, thank you. I grew up as a lawyer and a person at the firm, and I am so grateful for our 20 years of work together. I also thank retired Chief Judge of the Northern District of Illinois, Ruben Castillo, who was my first role model of a judge. Thank you, committee members, for considering my nomination and I welcome your questions. Thanks, Ms. Maldonado. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Chair Durbin, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Grassley, and thank you to the other members of this committee for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Senators Carper and Senator Coons for the kind introductions this morning, and thank you for recommending me to uh, President Biden and for your support uh, throughout this process. I want to thank President Biden uh, for nominating me and for the trust that he's placed in me. I am humbled and honored. Next, I want to thank my parents, George and Olivia Williams, who are in their heavenly homes but are with me in spirit. My parents raised my five siblings and I in a Christian home with lots of love and support. I'm forever grateful. Next, I wanna thank my five siblings, Deborah, Susan, Georgette, Sheila, Henry. 
my brother-in-law, author, sister-in-law, Nanette, for all their love and support throughout the years. Next, I want to thank my wife, Tarina, who's present with me this morning. Tarina is a nurse practitioner in Delaware. Uh, she practiced for many years uh, in the transplant area and now practices in endocrinology. Uh, Trina and I have been married for 27 years, and we've been a couple for 37 years, starting in high school. Uh, and we have two children, Amira and Greg, who are the apples of our eyes. Next, I want to thank uh, the other uh, support that I have with me this morning. Uh, my eldest niece, Jamake. Uh, my uh, best friend, George Reed. Uh, his younger brother and my younger brother, Scott Reed, who's a uh, U.S. Magistrate Judge in the Eastern District of PA. Uh, my godmother, their mother, Joan Reed. Uh, and my uh, two longtime friends, uh, Solomon Hunter, who uh, he and I started practicing law together, and Derek Price, uh, who is a friend since college. I also want to thank the host of family and friends uh, who are watching remotely, uh, who could not be with me in present today, but I know you're with me in spirit. Next, I want to thank my partners at Fox Rothschild, my colleagues at Fox Rothschild, special thanks to my mentors, Abe Rich, Stephanie Resnick, and the whole host of others uh, that are back home viewing uh, uh, this remotely. I also want to thank my pastor, Jerome Lewis, and my church family at Seeds of Greatness. Thank you for all your love and support. With that, Senators, I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, for the record, Senator Duckworth was tied up in another committee. She has a statement in support of Ms. Mendoza, Ms. Maldonado, as well as uh, Judge Lee, who was on the previous panel, and we will make certain that it is submitted for the record. Uh, I might also say that we're on a roll call. Luckily, lucky for me, Senator Coons has already voted, so he's going to uh, be handed the baton just a moment after I uh, make one or two observations, uh, and then I'll uh, rush off to vote, and he'll complete the work with Senator Grassley. Uh, Ms. Maldonado, I, I just amazed when I look at your background and find you clerking on the Northern District Court for two years and the many years in private practice, but then how many times you've been called to uh, serve in special capacity, uh, special assistant state's attorney to Cook County to investigate fraud alleged by a whistleblower, appointment by the Illinois Attorney General to serve as a consent decree monitor in two cases, and also appointment by the Illinois AG to serve as special assistant to investigate consumer fraud. What lessons have you learned in those special capacities beyond the regular practice of law? Thank you for the question, Senator Durbin. Um, these experiences have enriched my um, professional life tremendously. Uh, in, the in those capacities, I was working alongside government. So really seeing how government works, um, working with the individual attorneys general. Uh, the monitoring work has been particularly interesting to me. I do believe that I was selected for that work not only because of my substantive knowledge in employment law, but because of my temperament and reputation for being fair um, and even keeled. Um, in that capacity, I work with both defense counsel and the attorney general's office in ensuring that defendants are complying with consent decree requirements. Thank you very much. I'm going to make sure I make this roll call, leave it in the capable hands of Senator Coons, and I also, of course, trust Senator Grassley implicitly. Senator Grassley, take it away. Uh, I'm not going to ask a question of um, Ms. Don Nancy. Let me just say that. I'm sorry I can't pronounce your name. Uh, you're a key TAM lawyer, and as the author of the False Claims Act in 1986, uh, I'm glad that you're well acquainted with it because too often we find judges uh, doing damage to it from time to time, and then we in the Congress have to come back and and uh, clean up what judges interpret our law to weaken it. So I just hope you're aware of that, and as a judge, hopefully you can 
maintain it as a strong piece of legislation. Congratula congratulations, Judge Lochner, once again. Uh, I, uh, my first question is uh, pretty simple. Can you tell me how your time working as assistant U.S. attorney will inform you in your work as a judge? Sure. Um, Senator, thank you for the question. Um, before I started working as an assistant U.S. attorney, I had only limited familiarity with the criminal side of practicing law. I'd handled a lot of civil cases, including a lot of civil cases in federal court, but my criminal experience was limited. Working as an assistant U.S. attorney helped me get that experience very quickly and helped me feel very comfortable that I could handle everything from trying cases to the sentencing guidelines to all of the other aspects that you need to understand as a judge in the criminal system. In addition, I worked with crime victims. I worked with law enforcement agents. I understood that side of the practice. And I take that with me now as a judge. Those experiences have helped inform me and have helped make sure that uh, my decisions are based on the law, that I'm approaching issues neutrally, and that ultimately uh, my decisions are not based on any personal goals or preferences that I have, but rather the facts and circumstances of the case. And I'd point out that I had uh, later in my career many of the same experiences on the defense side of criminal cases and got to see that perspective as well. So my time uh, prior to taking the bench, I think has helped give me a balanced view of the work that I now do as a judge. My last question to you was based upon a quote from something you said at a naturalization ceremony. The Constitution was not a perfect document. In fact, it has been amended 27 times to try to make it better. And judges like me are still trying to figure out exactly what the Constitution means and how it applies to a particular circumstance. But this much I know, the Constitution and its amendments have established a set of core principles that have withstood the test of time. Other than through a constitutional amendment, does the Constitution meaning change with the passage of time? Senator, my understanding is that the Constitution has a fixed meaning. Sometimes it has to be applied to new areas. Uh, but no, I think there's a fixed quality to the Constitution. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, this is not a get you, que get you question when I quote something you wrote uh, uh, maybe a few years ago. You were serving as president of Delaware, Delaware State Barn. You wrote an article discussing George Zimmerman's case. In that article, you uh, noted your respect for our judicial system and as both an attorney and U.S. citizen. You concluded your article with this statement. Sometimes things can be found to be legal or justified under the law, but just not feel like justice to some of us. As social engineers, we need to constantly push the law to be better. I take it from your statement that you think lawyers are social engineers. Do you believe that judges should also be social engineers? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, Senator, uh, I uh, understand the distinction of the roles between a judge and a lawyer. Uh, that uh, quote uh, was referencing uh, lawyers as social engineers, lawyers and others in society uh, can be social engineers and uh, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, particularly uh, as uh, Charles Hamilton Houston, uh, one of my heroes said that lawyers can either be social engineers or parasites on society. So I do believe that lawyers uh, have an obligation to use their skills to make society better. That's different than the role of a judge. The role of a judge is to be fair and impartial, to apply binding precedent to the specific facts of the case before them without personal view or bias. And if I'm so fortunate to be confirmed, that's what I would do. Yeah. I didn't think I'd have a chance to answer you a question, Nancy, if you'll forgive me by being personal for the reason I gave you. Uh, in 2012, you re represented the Brady Center for Prevention of Gun Violence. You signed an amicus brief supporting a ban on what you described as military assault style assault rifles. You also suggested that AR-15s are uniquely dangerous because of the feature of the protruding grip. Your briefs, so now getting to the question, your brief suggests that 
Features like protruding grips or telescoping stocks make rifles more dangerous. Both generally make a rifle easier to aim, but the brief seems to say that this isn't as important for self-defense. Can you explain why you think that this is important for offensive but not defensive use of firearms? Thank you for the question, Senator Grassley. Um, I was asked to come on for the Brady Center um, to serve as local counsel, and I will admit that I am not an expert in firearms. However, I was involved with the brief and read the brief, which very, was a very measured argument within the confines of Heller, within the framework of Heller. Um, and I found, found the brief to have very persuasive arguments. Um, I will say that that particular assault weapons ban is still um, in force um, in Cook County. Um, so it has been upheld. A like ban was upheld um, by the Seventh Circuit. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I yield, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Grassley. I'm uh, happy to yield to Senator Kennedy if you'd prefer uh, before a question. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Judge Loker, um, I have a, a simple observation for you. Go Irish. Um, ha. My uh, son graduates, uh, from, one of my twin sons graduates this weekend from the University of Notre Dame. Um, and I am encouraged uh, to see your elevation to the service uh, on the district bench should you be confirmed. Uh, if you could just briefly speak to what about your experience as a magistrate judge has prepared you for service as a federal district court judge. Sure. Uh, Senator, before I was a magistrate judge, I had a balanced practice, both civil and criminal cases, on both sides of both types of cases. So I felt pretty confident that I could make the transition to the bench and, and be an effective judge. But you never know for sure until you do it. And now that I have served as a magistrate judge for the last year, I'm more confident than ever that I understand what it takes to be a good judge. I'm committed to the rule of law. I'm uh, committed to deciding cases based on the facts and the law. And I'm ready to make that transition to doing the same work as a district judge. Thank you. Ms. Maldonado, um, I strongly support President Biden's um, commitment to increasing the diversity of experience on our federal bench, as well as the diversity of background. Uh, when it comes to the courts, ensuring that we have litigators with strong capability and experience on both sides, plaintiff and defense, uh, sitting in district court benches is something I support. Uh, why should we value ensuring that we have experienced uh, attorneys with both plaintiff and defense side experience uh, on our district courts? Thank you for the question, Senator Coons. Um, I have represented plaintiffs um, for most of my career, although I've also represented defendants, which I think gives me a very unique perspective because I've been on both sides of the V. Uh, I think the value of my, my plaintiff side work is that um, I have a first-hand view of what it takes to prove a case, um, you know, seeking discovery to prove a case, uh, garden variety discovery disputes. Um, I also understand the burden that this these, uh, that discovery can have on an organization or a defendant. Um, I also understand um, the people behind um, the parties. So the working men and women who I've represented, I understand that their case is the most important to them. And I will, that will translate to on the bench, me being diligent before, on behalf of any party that becomes, comes before me. Thank you. Greg, wonderful to see you here today. Uh, I followed your career closely, and I'm thrilled that you're willing to step forward and take on this uh, role of public service. Um, our district court is known as a venue uh, both for very complex cases and intellectual property cases, and our bar is particularly well known for being collegial, uh, and I think it's important our bench uh, be collegial as well. I'd be interested in hearing about how your experience as a special master um, has given you particularly relevant experience in managing um, the challenges of discovery and timing and uh, conflict resolution, whether you're confident you can leave behind your role as an advocate, which you've excelled at uh, now in decades of practice, and how important you see collegiality uh, in this small federal courthouse with just a few judges and how you would contribute to that. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, I agree that our uh, district court is very collegial. Uh, I've had the honor for the last two years of serving as a special master uh, in the district court. And in doing so, I utilize the experience uh, that I've gained 
over my more than 27 years of practice, uh, and particularly uh, more than 20 years in intellectual property litigation, uh, and serving as special master in uh, intellectual property matters and complex civil litigation matters. Through that experience, I've come to really appreciate the importance of a judicial officer uh, being um, fair and impartial, uh, to uh, be well prepared, uh, to uh, apply binding precedent to the specific facts uh, of the uh, case in front of them, but also to exercise judicial restraint uh, so that in my role as a special master, that I did not exceed the scope of my authority, even though some of the litigants at times tried to have me answer questions that were not properly before me, uh, and to treat everyone with respect, uh, to, to make litigants feel like they've had uh, an opportunity to be heard, uh, and to uh, issue um, clear and concise decisions in a timely manner. I think all of those things will serve me well. Uh, with respect to the collegiality on the court, uh, that's one of the hallmarks of the District of Delaware. Uh, during my time of, of practicing before the court, I've had the honor of appearing before all of the judges uh, in, on the court. And I've had the honor of serving the court in various capacities and appreciate the collegiality. And if I'm so fortunate to be confirmed, I would continue to contribute to that collegiality in an attempt to maintain the high quality of the court in the District of Delaware. Well, thank you. My last question. Um, you've been a significant contributor, a real leader in our legal community in Delaware. Um, you've been elevated to the president of the state bar. The governor's looked to you to help lead the judicial nominating committee. The federal bench has asked you to serve as a special master. Uh, I referenced in the introduction uh, to me a memorable role that you took in moving our uh, bar from uh, simply attending a Martin Luther King Day breakfast to actually engaging in significant service. Um, what's the role of an attorney, um, a community leader, and a judge in fostering and promoting diversity? Uh, Delaware is a very diverse state relative to many others uh, in our country. Uh, our bench has not always reflected that diversity, and I think that is one of the um, strengths you bring to this service in addition to your exceptional career as an attorney. What's the role of a judge and a lawyer in promoting diversity? Okay, let me start with the role of an, a, a lawyer. I, I believe that uh, we all have the uh, responsibility to encourage diversity. I think uh, diversity uh, 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 increases uh, both public confidence uh, in the bar, uh, it increases public confidence in the bench, uh, and it appreciates and it adds value uh, to all of those areas. Uh, as a judge, uh, first and foremost, my job is to uh, uh, apply binding precedent in a fair and impartial manner to the specific facts of, of the case in front of me. I hope that by the nature, if I am so unfortunate, uh, so fortunate to be appointed, that uh, my appointment will uh, assist in uh, uh, improving public trust uh, in the judiciary system, uh, that it will uh, inspire uh, young folks from all backgrounds to pursue a, a career in the law, uh, and it will uh, encourage other lawyers uh, to commit themselves to public service and, and pursue the opportunities to serve on the bench. Great. Thank you. Thank you to all our nominees. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Maldonado, did I say that right? Yes, thank you, Senator. Okay, you're a, you're a, a, a key TAM lawyer? I have um, litigated key TAM cases, right, yes. cool. You're also a yoga instructor? I am, Senator. Double cool. <laughs> thank uh, you. You're going to keep teaching if you're on the bench? or You teach, don't you? I, I teach. I actually was, um, one judge is currently sitting suggested that I do a class for judges. Oh. The judges gym. Oh, great. <laughs> Um, Mr. Williams, tell me about the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Uh, th thank you for the uh, question. Uh, 
uh, Senator. Uh, the uh, privileges and community and uh, uh, immunities clause. Privileges uh, are immunities clause. Right. Uh, uh, that's uh, part of the uh, 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 Bill of Rights and part of the, uh, uh, I believe, the First Amendment. Uh, it's it's been a while, Senator. That my, my practice is. Uh, primarily intellectual property. Uh, so um, uh, it's been a while since uh, I've faced an issue uh, with the privilege and immunity clause. It doesn't come up every day in my the practice. Privileges are immunity. Privilege or, or immunity clause doesn't come up every day in my practice. What right. I can tell you that if I was faced with an issue uh, uh, that involved the privilege or immunities clause, I would uh, review the binding Supreme Court precedent on the issue and uh, apply uh, that binding precedent to the specific facts of the case in front of me. Okay, tell me what rights are guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment. Uh, Sixth Amendment uh, uh, guarantees uh, uh, right to uh, uh, right uh, to a speedy trial. Right. Uh, right uh, uh, to counsel. Right. Uh, and uh, also. Uh, uh, Right to speedy, uh, right to counsel, and also uh, uh, that's the fifth right uh, against uh, self-incrimination, which is in the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Tell me what the holding was in Obergefell. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. The, uh, the the holding in Obergefell v. Hodges. Uh, Senator, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I haven't uh, had the occasion to. Uh, deal with that issue. Uh, I don't recall that specific case as I sit here uh, uh, in front of you. But what I can tell you is that if the issue decided in that case uh, came before me, I would uh, review uh, binding Supreme Court precedent and apply it to the specific facts of the case in front of me. Okay. Um, in 2015, Mr. Williams, you gave a speech and you said that the modern judicial system today is more racist than it was 100 years ago. Did you say that? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. You're welcome. Uh, uh, I don't believe that's the uh, specific quote that I said. Uh, I believe you're referring well, let, let to- me, Let me read you the quote so there won't be any misunderstanding. Becoming a felon is more devastating today than when existed during Jim Crow. Jim Crow. And you were you were talking about the uh, judicial system uh, in Delaware. Thank you for the question, Senator. You're welcome. I made those comments as uh, co-chair of the Access to Justice Commission, which was a commission that was created by the Delaware Supreme Court. Yes, sir. But, uh, that but I was asked. Tell me what the, you meant. The chair. I, I know. So, what, I read the uh, the interview. I, tell me what you meant. I was referring to uh, a description uh, that uh, others uh, have made uh, to describe the condition of felons in terms of uh, the term Jim Crow, meaning. Well, well, let, me, let me stop you. Do you believe? that the judicial system in Delaware, in America, is more racist today than it was 100 years ago? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, uh, no, I do not believe that the system today is more racist than it was 100 years ago. Uh, what I was describing what, was the... Uh, well, but, but why did you say becoming a felon is more devastating today than when existed during Jim Crow. Uh, I was referring to the conditions of, of, of the inordinate uh, amount of people of color who, when they become felons, uh, are, are faced with loss of economic opportunity, uh, loss of voting rights, uh, loss of driving license, loss but of But that happens housing. to an Hispanic How as well, right? Uh, it happens to if you're convicted. It, it happens to everyone who becomes a felon, but the 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 task of the committee was to examine uh, the reasons why there are such glaring racial disparities in the population 
of people of color in Delaware as compared to and you the think population that's, you, you think of, that's of because people of racism? incarcerated. You think that's because of racism? Uh, I did not uh, say. Uh, my, I know. I'm that, asking you. Do you think that's because of racism? I believe that uh, race plays a factor in uh, Delaware uh, 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 across in 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 across uh, the in Delaware and beyond, uh, and that uh, uh, studies have shown that uh, uh, there is a uh, disparity uh, in the prison population that just can't be explained by uh, just nature and it be coincidence and that race plays some factor. It's not the only factor. Right. Uh, economic uh, condition, money, ability to pay bail, et cetera, plays a factor and some other things play a factor. Uh, so at that time, I was serving as right, well, chair. Let me stop you because my, my chairman here has been very very uh, uh, indulgent. I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, do, do you think uh, uh, photo IDs, requiring a photo ID to vote is in, inappropriate? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that uh, voter IDs right. uh, requirement for voting what do you think? is permissible. What do you think? Uh, I, Senator, uh, follow binding Supreme Court precedent. Yeah, uh, but what do you think? Uh, You've written articles saying that, that that's racist, haven't you? I have not. Okay. I have not. Well, you've went, written articles opposing voter ID, have you not? I have not. Okay. So you think it's okay? I do. Okay. That's all I got. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your indulgence. Of course. Um, thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, I'd like to thank all three of our nominees on this panel and the two nominees on the previous panel. I'd like to also express uh, my gratitude to your families uh, and friends, those who've come to support you today. Uh, and before I adjourn, uh, I just need to make one quick logistical note. Uh, members of this committee who intend to submit questions for the record uh, for the nominees, those are due by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, May 18th. The record will remain open until that time uh, for the submission of letters of support or similar materials. Uh, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.